Uh, hello. Hi, Matt. Uh, hi. Uh, no, I'm uh, Matthew Glacius. I'm a fellow and a blogger at the Center for American Progress. And uh, I'm Noah Millman. Uh, I blog primarily at the American scene, uh, occasionally at The Economist, and uh, as well, I blog at uh, Millman's Shakes blog on theater. Right. Um, I don't know anything about theater, so... So then we won't talk, talk about, about that. that. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. All the world's a stage. That's what I know. Um, but um, I, I think uh, we, we wanted to talk about um, educational reform, which is something uh, that we've sort of both... Um, yeah. Both written about uh, recently, and and you have some uh, some practical experience with, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, I've been involved in the charter school movement in sort of one capacity or another, primarily in the capacity of actually serving and then chairing uh, the board of a charter school for like the last six years. Um, I'm not currently the chair, um, but I'm still on right. the board. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, you know, my mother was a teacher and and worked for uh -huh. the teachers union, so I've. Uh, Sort of seen both sides of, of of some of that sort of debate, so does but, she, it's, but it's a, does, does she feel it's a betrayal for you to go into charter schools? Oh, I don't think she pays very much attention to what I do. <laughs> okay, which is probably that's, good. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, yeah. Um, so, what 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 what's the name of the charter school? Uh, it's it's called a Democracy Prep. Okay. Um, it is a nonpartisan school. Democracy does not mean having to do with Democrats. Um, right. But the mission of the school is actually does sort of have a political dimension, at least in the sense of, of, of a civic dimension, right? The, the sort of special sauce that, you know, you, a lot of charter schools, particularly high-performing charter schools, have their own kind of special sauce of some sort. You know, right. they teach Chinese or they teach Latin or they, you know, whatever it is that they've, they've got that sort of permeates the school. Um, so, you know, democracy preps special sauce is civics. Um, so they do, cool. in addition to the regular curriculum, they do all sorts of stuff like voter you know, registration things, and they take the kids down to Washington, and they take them to the mayor's office, and they do, um, and they actually get the kids involved to a certain extent in advocacy for the school. Um, that's very much kind of bland, you know, right. not 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 very pointed advocacy, but it's it's still getting them involved in the process in a way that kids usually aren't. So that, that's kind of neat. That seems excellent. I am, you know, I am a, a charter school uh, fan, a proponent. Um, you know, I, I hang out in a, in a lot of liberal circles where there's um, <clears throat> considerable, you know, charter charter school skepticism. Um, and, and it struck me that the, the thing that's really telling, um, I think, about opposition to charter schools is that uh, some fairly rigorous studies came out uh, recently which show that the average charter school is about as good or as bad as the average uh, conventional public school. Right. And the sort of skeptics ran all around Washington, or at least the, the left-wing sides of Washington, kind of touting this study as if here at last they had their knockdown point, which was that charter schools on average are about average. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it seems to me that that almost in and of itself is an admission of defeat, right? I mean, if you can't find a study saying that the conventional public schools are actually better, then what? Then what is the problem? You know, I mean, giving people sort of choice and options and creating um, an environment in which there can be experimentation and people can try new things has a certain, you know, positive value. All, all on its own, right? But the concern you might have is, well, no, I mean, we, we need the experts, you know, we, we need to keep the system controlled or else things are going to get much worse. Um, and if it turns out, you know, that they don't, that letting people uh, try a whole bunch of new stuff produces the same results on average, um, then that strikes me as a pretty compelling reason to sort of you know, let people experiment, let, let parents um, have a little bit more choice. Um, and obviously the hope would be, you know, to, to scrutinize, like, what's wrong with the lowest performing schools, uh, you know, shut them down, have the better ones expand, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, but, you know, I mean, average results is pretty good. Well, I, I, so I think I, I'm not familiar with the, the details of the methodology of the study, mm -hmm. for, for one thing. So um, my anecdotal impression you know, I'm in New York City, and the charter that I'm involved with is in Harlem. And my anecdotal impression is that a lot of the energy right. in the charter movement is around um, 
uh, underserved areas, areas where the schools tend to be relatively bad, where you know you have schools with 90 plus percent of the students who are eligible for uh, full school lunches, and, and yeah, certainly, and, New York. you know, and so on and so forth, right? So, and and the charters that I'm familiar with that are outside of that template, you know, that mm -hmm. are that are that are not targeting uh, the, that sort of student population, um, tend to be sort of more one-off sort of quirky experiments of one sort or another, like, you know, we, you know, we want to do a charter that's very organic food oriented or something because right. we're, you know, we're a group of parents that are all into that. Right. Um, so I think sort of the case for experimentation, qua experimentation, right. Uh, like people should be free to try different things and why should everything be centrally controlled? Right. I don't think is really the core, uh, thing that animates, uh, the, the, the charter school advocates. Right. Right. Um, you, you know, you I don't think it is either. So I think I think the real question is, uh, uh, for most people, sort of. I think there's two there's two policy questions, right? And and one is uh, whether you can get you know better results, which sort of raises the right. question of what constitutes results, right? right. And um, and then what does it do to uh, sort of budgetary? Stuff. What is it? What are the consequences for the status right. of teachers for the way the unions work? You know, there's a, there's a lot of follow-on consequences if you tried uh, to massively expand charters um, right. beyond where where they are, what they are right now, which is which is I think mm -hmm. like two two percent of the po of the student population or something is in charter schools now. So yeah, I mean, but it, it varies enormously from, uh -huh. from state to state and from from place to place. But yeah, it's but, small. But, but you're, I mean, sort of what you're. I feel like the, you said you hang around a lot of, with liberals who serve as charter skeptics. I feel like the whole charter school debate is really a debate among liberals, right? Between different yes. you know, different camps within, you know, broadly defined the left side of the spectrum, right? Because um, the if we're talking about charters that are targeting, you know. Um, Poor, uh, you know, urban areas, which is where, what my impression is, is the, the sort of the heart of the movement. Uh -huh. um, you're not talking uh, about a constituency that is the the, the, the right uh, is pays that much attention to. It's not an electoral, you know, it's not it's not sure, right, fighting right, right, for right, right. it electorally yeah. and so on and so forth. So, you know, um, this is well, except really the, I mean, the right does have an interest in the. Um, you know, sort of defunding of, of teachers' unions. Yeah, yeah, but if you if you actually comes with expanded uh, charter schools, uh, not necessarily. I think I think the if you it, I think there's something some degree of difference in the debate over, for example, school vouchers, and the debate right. over charter schools, and and Definitely. that and and that I think has partly to do with um, uh, sort of uh, the whole issue of religion, right? And, right. and 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 partly I think to do with the sort of the voucher argument is a much more sort of clear way of taking money out of the state sector, right? Even right. if it sort of ultimately cycles through because you tax and then you give it back as a voucher, right? It, it's it's right. taking control away from the state, whereas a charter really sort of isn't. You know, the state performs the, the function still of authorizing the charters, evaluating, you know, ultimately right. potentially withdrawing the charters. You know, there's, a, there's right. a regulatory apparatus that that exists over it, which I don't think any conservative would want to see applied to the private school world. You know, so it's, it's, so it's a very, I think they're different kinds of arguments. Um, you you've right. talked a lot on your blog lately. You've made a few references. I'm curious where you got the phrase to uh, to, to to edu nihilism, right? Oh yeah. Well, you know, it's a phrase I made up. So okay. I'm, I'm I'm a writer. I don't I don't really know things, but I but I can make up words. Um, and you know, the, the point I was making is that you know, so education reformers, you know, by definition, um, tend to be sort of optimists about the the possibilities of education policy, mm -hmm. you know, and talk about how, well, if we did this or that, I mean, it could be charter schools, it could be more performance pay, it could be, you know, different class sizes or whatever it is that, you know, kids would, would do better in school and, and good things would happen for the country. Um, so naturally, you know, there's skepticism about these arguments. And because... Um, because teachers unions tend not to like these reform proposals, uh, organizations and, and individuals that they back often, you know, latch on to the to the skeptical arguments. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the point I was making is that, you know, all the most persuasive skeptical arguments just point to the idea that 
um, you know, that either nothing works in schooling, that it's all just sort of demographics, or that we have a, an epistemological problem and we just have no idea how to make schools work better, you know, things like that. When you say um, nothing works, though, Right. You don't. Well, actually, I, I I don't think that nothing works. No, I but mean, even even when you're talking about these arguments, right? I don't think anyone says no one's making a sort of radical de-schooling argument, right? And saying basically. Well, we don't I don't know what argument they are making. I mean, I I sort of hear from my commenters all the time, you know, well, like stop ragging on teachers. You know, really, it's all it's all about poverty or it's all about these kids' parents. Uh, well, so you know, let me let me suggest. I suspect that. some people on on the right. Um, well, no, I mean, I mean, I think some people, uh, you know, privately probably think that it's all genetic or, or something like that. Um, like you know, which only will be. I mean, I mean, obviously, obviously, there are lots of things that make a difference to children's lives that don't happen, you know, inside classrooms. I, I mean, I think that that's that's common sense, um, and it shows up in in, in all the data. Um, but the implication of that kind of argument at least is that we should just like not invest a lot of money in K-12 school. Well, that's one possible implication, but I don't think, I think that's an implication of what you said was, if what, let, let me, let me, let me sort of tease out different possible things of what, of what Let's nothing tease. works might mean, right? right? So if you believe that the objective of Right. If you believe that every kid has, you know, roughly the same potential, right, leave out sort of people mm -hmm. way out on the edges of the, of right. the curve, you know, geniuses on the one end and people with organic retardation or something on the other end. And like sure. basically everyone in the middle is kind of the same. Right. And yeah. so, you know, and, and that that potential is substantially not unlocked right now. Right okay. by the by the system across the board in some fashion or for some big segment it's not unlocked for a big chunk of the mm -hmm. students it's not unlocked. Then what right. you would expect is that there was a certain set of techniques or or, or what have you in, in or what ways you uh -huh. could run a school that would either significantly improve overall performance or significantly narrow the gaps between sort of poor performers and stronger performers within the system. Right. 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 But right. you could believe that the system work suboptimally, right, or even mm -hmm. massively suboptimally for a certain segment, right, and still believe that those gaps can't completely be closed. You could also believe that incrementally, right, you could get sort of stronger performance relative to, right, some particular set of metrics, right, right even though the cost might be worse performance relative to a different set of metrics, right? You could teach math, well, sure. right, more math and more effective math, and that would take more time, and that would trade off against, and then you'd fill in right. the blanks. Oh, right. 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 So so I think it's important if you ask sort of the question, sort of, does anything work? You know, what does work mean? Um, and I think a lot of people assume, right, on the pro-charter side, right, that, you know, what quote-unquote work you know, not, you know what, what it means for it to okay. work is, you know, for you know all students to reach some very very high level of achievement. And right. one of the things I worry about with respect to the charter advocates is that I think there's much more there's much lower hanging fruit out there, right? And there's a great deal of overselling of of a good product, right? Mm -hmm. um, no, I that, think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I mean, if you have kids. Right. If you have, if you if you articulated the goal was we want to eliminate functional illiteracy in the United States, yeah. Right. As opposed to we want to you know get you know everybody above average, right. Right. If you right, articulated right. the goal, we don't want right. any schools in the United States where sexual assault happens on a regular basis, okay. right. <laughs> you know, which is sure. not a right. That's not a trivial thing, right. That there yeah. are such schools. There's you know more than you'd like yeah, to yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And those are, like, I think, like, like you have to know what your goals are. And if right. you asked yourself, you know, if you asked, if you asked those kinds of questions and held, uh, held all schools accountable to those kinds of, of, right. of, of, of metrics, you'd get different results than you do if you say, you know, we're going to, you know, everything is going to be judged on the basis of high stakes testing of all students and, we, you know, and, and, and everyone's going to be on the same uh, metric and whatever that, you know, even if a school's working fine, we're going to, you know, make them conform to this, you know, this new methodology of measurement um, right. of their performance, okay. which I think is much more the direction that school reformers have gone. Um, well, well it, to reel, reel it back, though, maybe, I mean, I mean, I, I, I was glad you brought up 
literacy because I feel like, you know, I feel like this is something that goes sort of oddly missing in uh, a, a lot of discussions we, we have in, in, in the U.S. Um, sometimes I think that, you know, people don't just don't actually realize how widespread functional illiteracy kind of is. Yeah. Um, I read Paul, Paul, Paul Krugman had a column. Uh, maybe it was yesterday's column, and it was, um, you know, it was about how, you know, edu more education isn't necessarily, uh, you know, the ticket to, to upward economic mobility that people sometimes say it is. Um, you know, and all, all the data he had, you know, seemed sound, and, and the argument even seemed sound. But what he was talking about very specifically was sort of like the marginal person getting a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is interesting. Um, well, well so you're very much a college skeptic, right? Which I think is well, also I'm, 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 yeah, I am. Um, but you know, what I think I'm not a skeptic about is that you know, being able to read and write um, has a lot of practical advantages. Um, you know, and I, I can't prove that it will raise your income if you're if you're able to read and write. Um, but certainly for things that like, that should actually uh, be pretty of, easy to prove. I. I, I <laughs> Probably somebody could, but, yeah. you know, I'm not I, I'm not out doing it. But, you know, for lots of things, people, it's just common sense, right? So, like, the, the Internet exists now. And uh, most people, you know, like the Internet a lot. But you really have to be able, I mean, if you can't, if you can't use email, if you can't read websites, you're just missing out on something uh, in life, to say nothing of Shakespeare or, or, or whatnot. Um, and in terms of things liberals, you know, um, care about, like politics, right? I mean, if, if low-income people in particular grow up um, and they're not able to, to read and write and participate right. in literate culture, it's extremely difficult for them to be efficacious politically. I mean, you can't you can't write a letter to your congressman if you can't write a letter. Right, and they're much um, more likely, and historically, right, the, the, they were much more, they would be much more likely to be either ignored or captured, right? Right, right, I, I mean, exactly. And so, you know, while obviously um, it would be better for the median student to do better, you know, I mean, by definition, um, you know, that the, the focus should be on the fact that really bad outcomes are sort of shockingly widespread uh, in, in the current system. And, I mean, I just I refuse to believe that it's not possible to, you know, organize schools that manage to teach people um, how, to, how to read. Well, I think it's... I think the promise of char of high performing charters, right? Things like mm -hmm. the KIPP schools, like you know, democracy prep, is you know th what they promise is not only you know can we you know teach all the kids who come here you know how to read, but we can get right. you know we're we're getting our student body you know well beyond that so that they are competitive right. with you know and and I think it's wonderful what they have you know been able to do. I think there are real questions about scalability right. and replication and sort of how you know what they demand of their staff and how many, you know, could you right. build a teaching staff for a much larger scale that, 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 that had those demands on it? I think those are all really good questions. And the nice thing about charters, right, is you sort of, you don't change the whole system all at once, right? You're incrementally moving in a certain right. direction school by school, um, which I think is, right. is, is good and conservative way to reform things. Um, but, um, but, but the hope, right, is that some of what the high performing schools do is stuff that the rest of the system, um, you know, can learn from, right? That that you get something resembling uh, uh, evidence-based uh, decision making on how schools are right. run. What I think right. in the general system, I think though there are some real sort of pathologies about applying those lessons. And one of the difficulties, right? And this cycles back to the advantage that charters have of having uh -huh. choice. You know, having been chosen by the parents who send their kids there, right? One of the right. difficulties we have is. Uh, we don't want to talk about how to, you know, about the different potential of students, right? We're, we like sorting people. Okay. We like sorting people by how rich they are, right? That's the way right. we sort people in this country primarily, right? We say, you know, right. you, if you have enough money to buy a house in a good school district, then your kids will go to a good school, right? Um, yeah, yeah. We, we seem pretty comfortable with that, for better or for worse, Right, but we're not very comfortable uh -huh. saying, okay, we need a better system for finding the kids who have a lot of academic potential, who are not in those, you know, in those areas, in those schools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. We we talk much more in terms of we have to leave. You know, we we you know, all our kids have to do X or, you know what I mean? Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. I mean, Americans are we're 
Uh, yet, well, right. So, I mean, what happens is that Americans like to think that we're not comfortable with the idea of, of tracking students and sorting them. Um, but we have a combination of... But then, in effect, we do, because yeah. parents sort themselves into different school districts. But there are a lot of other pernicious effects to that, right? You know, there are they're on both ends of the spectrum, right? There are you know, okay. there there are kids that don't get family you know, and I see this I've seen this in democracy prep dozens of times, right? You know, that you have a, a class come in, right, and they're not an undifferentiated mass. You know, they're not all uh -huh. the same. There's a there's a pretty big dispersion. You know, there are kids who right. are going to struggle their whole time there and you know that they're gonna struggle their whole time there because they're just not as bright as some of the other kids who come in. You've got uh -huh. other kids who you can see in their first year, they come in three grades behind in their reading right. ability, and you can see already, you know, we, we start in sixth grade, you can see already, right, that this is a kid who, you know, with the right nourishment could do college work, right? Right. You know, um, and, you know, and the fact that that, that that is the case means, like, leaving aside, like, we tend to sort of say that also, we tend to reduce a lot of social justice questions to equality of opportunity, and they aren't all completely reducible yeah. to it. But let's leave no. aside the social justice question of, like, sorting by wealth. It's also just uh -huh. not very efficient. Right, right. I mean, it's very, very sort of crude. Uh, you know, this is, if I if I may, incidentally, you know, I, one of the other things I write about is my, my crank uh, housing policy concerns. Mm. Um, you know, and I, and I always do try to tell, you know, people who are involved in, in education that this is something they ought to care about um, a little bit more, that, you know, in theory, there's no particular reason why houses in certain parts of the country should be um, completely out of the price range of, of other people. The, uh, you know, natural, the, the reason the buildings in Manhattan are also tall is that the land there is expensive. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we've moved to a dynamic in the United States where increasingly we don't want to make it legal to build housing that people could afford in desirable areas. Um, and that is... Well, they become less much. desirable areas if you built all that. Right? Well, yes. I mean, that's part of the story. But, I mean, part of the story is that it's just straight up illegal, you know? I mean, No, I understand, but part of the reason, the reason to preserve it is not merely, right, it's not merely about preserving the val like like making your house your house price go up all the time that is part of it the other part of it is that you genuinely want to preserve the 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 experiential value of what you have right you move right i mean that that's part place with really tall buildings <laughs> yes i mean i mean that's part I, mean, I live of it, in one but, of those then neighborhoods then the, within new york right i live in park slope right right and right, that's exactly. a neighborhood where you can't build you know when they the, the, the one you know tall building that they built in the last uh, decades and that i've been living here right there was a huge outcry over it that you know that, right you know, right I, I think, but I mean, then I, I think another part of it, though. I mean, I mean, because this is what, what what I think is is important to understand school wise is just that on the local level. I mean, the easiest way by far to solve any kind of like social problems is to just not let any poor people come into your jurisdiction. Right. Um, you know, and, and that's, that's rational people. What? That's how Finland stays Finland. Yeah, or, well, Denmark, I think, yeah. is, is actually the, the, the prime example. of It's sort of like the gated community of nations, mm -hmm. and, and no immigrants come there. And they even, they have super high taxes, so some very rich people leave. Um, but it's still fine, and they have this very sort of nice, middle-class, clean, boring um, country. Um, and, you know, kids do well in school, and there's no crime, and... Uh, well, I mean, there's some, but you, you know, You're anyway, a big fan and, of the and, model, and you could, I thought. Uh, well, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for it. Um, you know, there's not that much to be said for Denmark. Um, I mean, well, I, it depends. You know, I mean, Italy also has very restrictive immigration policies, and they're they're no Denmark uh, along a number of uh, dimensions. But yeah, I mean, you know, the United States, I do not think should should try to emulate that. But what I what I do think is that a lot of local jurisdictions in the U.S. Ha I mean, Denmark is quite small, and and so a lot of small parts of America are sort of become Denmark esque by making it not de jure illegal for poor people to move there, but in practice impossible. Right. No, I mean a lot of. I mean, it's one of the it's one of the ongoing debates about sort of what's happened in New York City. Right. Yeah. Is is to what extent is 
Right. To, to what extent has the, the revival of New York fed on itself in part because of demographic changes that were driven by the revival of the city, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, and in, in, in Washington, right, mm -hmm. uh, we, we have a situation where the um, commercial, you know, the office rents in downtown D.C. are the highest in the nation, um, you know, because, well, land is valuable here and, and the buildings are short. Um, but because there's high crime and very, very bad public schools, um, the residential, you know, real estate areas um, are not not as not as expensive as the, the sort of commercial ones. Mm -hmm. But you could very easily imagine sort of hitting a tipping point, which I think we may be on. Where just demographic change in the city drives lower crime rate and better school performance, mm -hmm. which makes it more expensive, and it sort of snowballs like that. Right. And conversely, you you might worry that you know, um, had sort of Michelle Rhee stayed on, and had she succeeded in making the schools do better, that all that would have happened is that the families that were attending those schools wouldn't be able to afford to live in the city anymore. That the, right. That the bad public services are integral to people's ability. Um, I, I mean, people live in, it's, it's not a coincidence that the poor people live in the neighborhoods with bad public services. And that if improving the services just prices people out of the neighborhoods, you know, you're not really helping. Well, uh, you're not really helping those people. Right. right. I mean, it's better than making the public services bad. Right. But it's... It's not the dream. I, I mean, that's this is a, if we can cycle back to education a little bit, right? This yeah. is one of the marks that goes gets charged against charter schools, right? Is that uh -huh. you know, particularly the high performing charter schools, right? Is that the student body doesn't actually look like the student body of a regular public school, regardless of uh -huh. what the demographics are. Yes, they may almost all be you know school lunch beneficiaries. Yes, they may be overwhelmingly black and Hispanic, but. The parents are all You're getting parents. the highly motivated parents. You're getting more motivated parents, right? And what I think is actually in some ways more important is uh, they can fire students, right? Well, so, you know, they, you know you, obviously there's a cost to that, right? Because the charter right. school is getting paid per student, and whatever right. they're paying for the building that they're in, assuming that they're paying for the building they're in, and whatever they're paying the staff, which they do have to pay their staff, and there's a certain administrative overhead regardless of, of how big your, your teaching staff yeah, is, yeah, yeah. you know, you've got to amortize that across your student body. You don't want to just drive your whole student body out. But, right, they have the option to take disciplinary measures, which in the extreme would include expulsion, that the regular right. system's not allowed to do. Not allowed to do categorically in most cases, right? At least in right. New York, right? You basically can't expel a student. Right. right. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the one charge against the, you know, their performance is to say, uh, well, you're not really uh, um, uh, teaching you know, students better. You're just getting better, you know, class of student. And I think right. there's, there's a couple of answers to that, neither of which is, is complete. I think the best answer to that is, like, uh, it, it is that the – Students who are who remain are learning much more in part because the particularly if you're talking about the most disruptive students, students that are violent or or, right. or otherwise really problematic to keep in a classroom, right? You know, the the students that remain are doing much better in part because those other students aren't there, and you can't just ignore that cost, right? When you look at the regular system, you can't say, you know, oh, you know, it's not, it's not just. Well that's, well, that's the question, right? I mean, is the expulsion of students, I mean, is that an actual treatment for the remaining students, or is it just a selection effect? Where, you know, I'm arguing, right. I'm arguing that, right. that there's some of both, right? That there is a selection right. effect. I don't think you can deny well, that, but that there's a big component that is actually improving the, the classroom environment. The other thing is that you don't know ab initio who's going to be in that pool of disruptive students, right? right? And a lot of those students, and certainly my experience at Marcus Prep is, a lot of those students actually don't have to be those students, right? Even kids right, right, who right. have organic, you know, problems of one sort or another, you know, emotional disabilities or what have you, right, with teachers who are trained how to, uh, you know, manage those students, right, you can, um, you know, you can, you know, keep a lot of them, most of them, I would say, you know, 
focused on sort of the work uh-huh. that, that, that needs to be done, and they don't become uh, a disruption to the classroom. And again, that's stuff that's harder to do um, in the regular system. I think the, the systematic answer to that is that you, you, know, you create financial incentives not to, you know, not to throw kids out. Right. Yeah. If, if well, we're, and, or or financial. I mean, I mean at a minimum, are. right? I mean, you should be keeping track of this this data in a way that lets you see. I mean, yes. some school, right? I mean, if it turns out that what one particular network is doing is it's some huge outlier in expulsions, right? Um, you, you know, I mean, then there ought to be negative consequences for that and, and rewards for schools that are able to, you know, perform well. Yeah, although without I, resorting I would, to huge quantities. Yeah. I, I mean, although I, 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 I would maybe say even. In general, I think you don't want to resort to too much in the way of bureaucratic dictats for how to run things. I think if you if you're worried that what's happening is a certain category of students is uh, you know is not being served right, right, then you pay more for them. That's what they do with special ed right now, right? In New right. York, you know, at least again, I don't know that much about the rest of the country, but in New York, at least, right, if you have a student with an IEP. Right, uh-huh. you, get, you get paid more for taking that student on um, if you're in new school or charter school or someone else is paid by the student, right? There's no reason you couldn't broaden that that principle yeah, yeah, if that's yeah, what yeah, you're yeah. concerned about. And that provides the incentive, theoretically, either for regular schools to be very reluctant to you know, get rid of certain categories of students or for other schools to focus specifically on those students and say, okay, look, right. we can do this, but we need a 1 to 12 ratio of you know, teachers to students in the class. And we can't right. do that unless you know we get paid this much. Um, I, I think I think the prom- the promise of charges ultimately is sort of opening up the ability to use sort of those kinds of intelligent incentives to you know move the population around instead of um, yeah. saying every every school needs to serve everybody, every school needs to serve everybody in the same way, and we're going to measure them all with the same you know the same exact yardstick. Um, I, I I don't believe that's the most efficient thing. I also don't think it's the most just thing. And then what you'll wind up is hopefully, um, uh, resi- you know, you'll want you'll still e- even in the most hopeful scenario, you'll still have you know a lot of residual inequality, a huge amount of residual inequality. I think the the notion that education is right. the answer to that is 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 another one of those, you know. You know, nothing works. Well, right. If what you're trying to do is eliminate economic inequality through education, you will fail. So don't try to do that. Right. Right. Although, you know, I mean, this is one of these things where I feel like there's a lot of discussion of that idea, but almost nobody who actually adheres to that idea. Well, who adheres to it or who talks as if they adhere to it? Well, I don't know. You know, who 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 adheres? To, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, I think. You know, I think the main thing animating people is simply the sense that there is, according to basically either account. I mean, this is what I was getting at with nihilism. There's some large quantity of wasted resources implicit in the the current school system. I mean, particularly in in large urban areas where, you know, there ought to be, um, as you were saying, I mean, there ought to be a lot of scope for people in a big city to be differentiating the kind of education programs that are provided so that different kids can be matched, you know, to some extent with with schools that are are appropriately designed. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting that we don't have the problem of big city school systems performing well, but small towns and rural areas having just these enormous logistical problems. Where, well, again, you know, when, there's, think, when there's not that many people, there can't be that many schools. Blah blah blah. Um, I think you have and, to. I mean, if you can, again, if you controlled for all of those demographic factors, right, it would be interesting. Right, to you see. do start yeah. to. See, yeah, you see some of it, and, and I mean, you definitely see that. Like, I mean, I know in Maine. Um, they have just incredibly high costs because their their um, student to teacher ratios are are hyper low mm-hmm. in a way that is just intrinsic to the geography, right. you know, of, of the state. Right? That uh, unless you're going to have sort of uh, one room schoolhouses, you know, there's there's no other way to to, to make the math work. Um, and you know, as it happens, we have these sort of poverty concentrations in, in big cities and, and sociological problems uh, associated with that. But in principle, cities are, you know, good venues in which to, to organize a school system where different people could go to different schools. Well, in principle, except, well, so 
again, this this comes back to a question, and then we should probably move on from education, but yeah. that, I, that I ask a lot, which is sort of what's what's the real political base for, you know, reform, right? So if right. if education reform is a debate that's pretty much an intra-left debate, right? Yeah, um, yeah. What's, you know, what is the political base for reformers, right? If the political base for reformers is, like, if your supposition, like, okay, what reform ultimately does is sort of drive poor people, you know, price poor people out, right, you know, um, because the, the poor people depend on sort of bad schools and bad and, and high crime or whatever to keep costs down enough for them to be able to live there right. at all, right, then, right, then the constituency for, um, you know, education reform, assuming that it is mostly an urban agenda thing, is right. people who would like not to have to spend to send their kids to, you know, uh, private school, uh, but who, uh, you know, but but who feel or or would like or would like to live in the city, you know, right. but don't because they um, because the schools are so lousy, um, and that. You know, that's a that's not really a very effective. No, it doesn't. Work. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, I think you, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, again, from the from the DC experience, or you see the same thing in in New York, um, where, but, but I'll talk about DC. You know, where I think reformers would like to have said that their base um, was uh, in the poor African American community. And that these are the people they're trying to help. That those are the families that are most hurt by the bad schools, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the, you know, the actual voting patterns, uh, it was the, you know, education reform constituency was very much um, a, a white yuppie constituency. Right. Um, and it's the same with the with the Bloomberg administration in, in New York. Yep. Um, and I think that that's that's generally the pattern. And obviously, it's not. Um, that's not a sustainable politics in, in any kind of way, because it's never going to be that the first priority of a yuppie constituency is to improve public schools in poor neighborhoods, because in like a bank shoddy kind of way, you know, that promotes a gentrification agenda. They're, they're like much more, right. you know, direct and, and immediate type, type concerns there. Um, so, so allow me to suggest, right, that, please. The, that the right political base... Right has to be right people whose who are working class in the expression that nobody uses in America anymore, Indeed. right? Whose jobs necessarily keep them in the city, uh -huh. right? And who therefore are not going to leave because somebody has to do those jobs, right? right? And a big percentage of those people, right, are. Uh, are actually in uh, sort of the kinds of jobs that are um, well, they're, they're they are reasonably likely to be uh, uh, members of SIU or uh, SEIU, excuse me, or uh -huh. 99 or um, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, ask me or, 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 or what have you, uh -huh. right? They're, they're very yeah. likely to be in those kinds of jobs so that the uh -huh. whole debate over the, the whole debate over unions and that relationship to education reform is a little bit that there's, there's a little bit of a cross current there, right? What you're, the, the, the real constituency for education reform, to put it bluntly, right, is the, 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 the kids of parents who are in some of these other unions or even in the teacher. Right. Team. No, well, I mean, that's something a Andy Stern used to say mm -hmm. um, all, all the time when, when he was uh, when he was the head of exactly. the CIU. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure the extent to which the, the new leadership there uh, agrees with him. Um, the other thing, I mean, the point, uh, a, a point I was trying to make is that uh, on some level, if you think, uh, if you think a couple moves ahead, I mean, the, the teachers themselves really have to be a constituency for trying to create school systems that show more in the way of results. Um, because the alternative in the long run is to simply take money out of the out of the system as a whole. Right. You know, I mean, I mean, wealthy people 
would do okay in a world where there were no public schools, but were also much lower taxes. Right. Right. I mean, it's the people who, who would lose out in that scenario are poor families and teachers. I mean, you know, the people in the education system. Right. Um, you know, so... I think it's always anyway, hard to get people to take the long view. It is quite... Right. And that's a very yes. long view if you're saying, you know, the risk is if you oh, don't yeah, do something yeah, yeah. about this, New York becomes Alabama. Right. Like, right, right, right. No, no, no. I mean, it, it, it definitely is. And, you know, and I mean, everyone in all walks of life is... Um, you know, primarily focused on the here and now right. and primarily focused on a, on a kind of loss aversion and, and status quo bias. But, you know, insofar as I am blogging away, that's uh, something I, I, I want people, uh, right. you know, always uh, to try to keep in mind. Um, should we should we pivot? I think we monetary should pivot. Policy? I don't have a good way monetary to pivot policy. to monetary policy, so I'll just say, that's tough. like, you and I, I think, see more eye-to-eye -eye than not on education reform, and, and we see more, less eye-to-eye on monetary policy, so... No eyes. Yeah. Well, um, perhaps we can say eye-to-eye -eye on this, then. Sure. You hear all the time in the press, people are just always talking about schools, education reform, yak, 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 and you right, know what's right, important. Right. Um, nobody ever talks about monetary policy. It's, like, not considered, like, a, like a big deal issue to talk about. Um, but it's, like, it's a really big deal. Right. So that, I think that's another way of – I think it's not true, by the way, that nobody talks about monetary policy, right? Glenn Beck talks about it all the time, right? Yes. So the only okay, people who talk enough. about monetary policy all the time are people who, think that mon who have the delusion that monetary policy as such doesn't have to exist and that the problem is that it does. Right, yes. Right. Okay, fair enough. Um, and once upon a time in this country, right, there was – very active debate on monetary policy, right? In yeah, it was like the main free thing. Free silver and Late all that. 19th century. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cross of gold. Yep, you got it. So um, I think, you know, I wrote a blog post about sort of why why people are still afraid of inflation, right? right. And, why, and, and I'm curious, I don't know if you read it, but I'm curious what you think sort of of the argument. And, and, and I think that's... That's a component to sort of why doesn't everybody talk about monetary policy, right? Is that the assumption that what mon the assumption I think is that what monetary policy is about is stopping inflation, right? Right, and that's so either you're worried about it, right, because we're doing wrong monetary policy, which is going to cause inflation, or you're not. But you don't talk about monetary policy as a way of doing of the other side of the equation at all, right? Right. right? Well, so but so I, I mean, Scott Scott Sumner um, mm -hmm. is, has written a, a, a number of times that people have this idea in their head that fiscal policy, for better or for worse, you know, impacts real output, and that monetary policy, for better or for worse, impacts just just inflation. Um, and that's the way it's discussed all the time. You know, we could do, like, maybe we need stimulus or maybe we need less spending. Um, and, and then monetary policy is about, about inflation. But there's just no... Um, Right. There's no support for that in, well, in there's sort no... of any kind of economic models or... So here's a folk uh, explanation, right, I think, of yeah, why that it. might be. Okay, Let's so um, on the fiscal side, right, I think people are confused. For, first of all, there's a very simple psychological reason, right? You know, if I give you money directly and you get the check, you know you got it, right? If monetary yes. policy is looser, nobody gives you a check, so you don't know that you got it. Right. Well, so that's one very simple explanation why, you know, a tax cut or a, a rebate or an extension of unemployment or whatever, right, feels like real action because somebody got it. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the other side, I think, is that when we talk about fiscal policy, we confuse it with industrial policy, right? So people talk about we need, you know, we should, when, when people talk about we need to spend more, right, I don't think when most people say, uh, when most people hear that the government gave money to the states, right, yes. to pay their, you know, payroll, right, yes. they don't think that's going to be good for the economy. They think that's going to be good for those people who didn't lose their jobs. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Yes, yes. Whereas yes. if the government spends money to build a bridge, right, people think either, oh, that's a waste, nobody's going to use that bridge, or, oh, that's good. Or it's that good, we can drive over the bridge. Right, right. exactly. So, so we, I think some of the reason people think of spending as potentially a way to get the economy moving is that they think of it not in terms of uh, increasing demand, but in terms right. of increasing productivity, 
right? D- d- right. Making investments that actually yield a return. Um, right, right, right. So, um, but on the on the inflation side, right, and sort of why are people afraid of it? And why aren't people afraid of deflation? Why don't they think of that as sort of yeah, what yeah, yeah. Does my 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 argument was basically that um, what the argument for inflation really means nowadays is it divides sort of relatively less affluent people uh, between those who think of themselves as, you know, prudent and thrifty and those who, and, 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 and the, the others, right? <laughs> in other words, right. in other words, and, and I think the reason for that has to do with the, la- the, the experience of lack of, of, of uh, much wage growth, if any wage growth, over the last generation. Right. So, like, the theory, right, yes. and it is just a theory, right, the theory is, you know, if you get inflation going, right, that will force people to take money out of, you know, very, very safe places and either spend it on goods and services or invest it in something that, you know, has real, you know, risk and return, and that in turn will, you know, either of those two things would do more to generate growth than sort of leaving everything in, in, in uh, yes. treasuries, you know, in a bank account, whatever. Right. That, um, I mean, sure. So, so that's that's sort of the logic of we need more inflation and how inflation is ultimately going to generate, you know, real growth, right? Well, the goal, right, so the idea, I mean, to, to, to be precise, is that current, higher current expectations of future inflation right. would lead to higher current real growth. Right. The, right. I think the... Uh, one thing you have to remember, though, is higher current expectations of inflation, right, will means that people think there is going to be more inflation, right? And if they yeah. perceive, if, if people thought, well, okay, my wages will go up with that, right? Once we see, yeah. once we see real, you know, we'll see real growth, like, 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 like the logic, of, another way of putting sort of the logic of, of sort of sort of why you have recessions, right, is wages and prices are sticky, Right, and what we need is to find, you know, a clearing price for labor. Everyone's wages, act- real wages, actually have to go down. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So if, if people don't think an increase in real output will lead to an increase in their wages, right. then all that's happening is you're paying higher prices. All that's happening is you're they've experienced higher prices, right, at various times. Prices sometimes go up, sometimes go down. They go down for computers, they go up for gasoline, you know, they go up for food right now. Like, like... Like, you know, prices yeah, fluctuate yeah, yeah, yeah. for a variety of reasons. They can believe prices go up, but they don't believe wages will go up. And so right. basically what inflation means, if, even if they think, yeah, this will work, it'll bring unemployment down, right, what they think is inflation is taking away my money and giving it to that unemployed guy. Right. Right. Uh, right. And this so, is w- so it's dividing people. Yes. I think that that's plausible if we even had discussion on that level. Um, although, I, I mean, I do think that this is why, you know, my sort of dream goal, uh, dream, dream scenario for, for, for the whole thing would be um, to have a, a money finance tax cut, um, to, you know, to actually give money um, to people, mm-hmm. uh, employed people, um, as the, the, the token, um, you know, for, for moving things up, that I think that this... Um, by money you know, finance, you mean do more quantitative easing, so and then, and then then have the deficit go up, right? And use the you right. Know, I mean, in in in, in 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 an explicit linkage, right. rather than doing this. Oh, Ben Bernanke announces quantitative easing, and people get pissed off and whatever. You know, uh, right. the banksters are getting my money, and then three months later, Obama right. and Congress agree to a payroll tax right. cut. Right. Con- I mean, Obama says we're going to give you three hundred billion dollars in a payroll tax cut, and how will we pay for this? Well, the Fed is going to buy the debt. Right. Right. So exactly. So and so then what you're getting is that you know there's the tax cut coming from the Fed essentially. The, I mean, or, so, or, or, or so, to, to, so the, to, to back this up, mm-hmm. I mean, it's that part of what people don't understand about this whole thing, um, you know, going back for, for, for years and years and years, is just the fundamental question of, well, I mean, why is the budget deficit potentially a problem? You know, I mean, what what, what is it that, that people worry about? And the concern is that we had a situation, you know, before and after 1990, you know, give or take. Uh, four years or so on, on either side when um, 
high budget deficits were driving interest rates uh, very, very high because um, the government had to offer a high interest rate to get anyone to borrow bonds. Mm -hmm. And so then when investors were able to get high interest rates lending to the government, they had to demand an even higher interest rate to, to lend to firms and mm -hmm. to households. So that was a big drag on, on economic activity. The Fed has, at all times, the ability to bring those interest rates down by engaging in uh, you know, different kinds of asset purchases. But the Fed might not want to do that because it sparks inflation if you just kind of do it you know, willy-nilly, out of control. So what uh, you know, the first President Bush and then Bill Clinton were both trying to do with their balanced budget deals was get the fiscal deficit under control, then that allows for interest rates to fall in a non-inflationary um, right. kind of way. So then flipping forward to the, the present circumstances where we have price level growth at a very low level and lots and lots of, of excess capacity in, in the economy, the proposal essentially is that fiscal and monetary policy um, you know, need to work, uh, work together to sort of mobilize the, the idle resources in the economy um, with the knowledge that inflation at a level that's somewhat higher than we have right now would be um, – quite bearable, that it's despite this sort of um, lot of stories about uh, food prices and, and gasoline over the past couple of months, if you look at the past three years of, of price level activity, we've been way, way below the, the recent trends. Mm -hmm. So that, that what, is my so, sermon. Right. So what, what I would say is that if, how do I put this, uh, you, you, you probably, I have my own sort of concerns about the Fed being much more explicitly sort of pro-inflation, but what they mostly have uh -huh. to do with is that I worry about the risks to, um, that I, I worry about the risks to the dollar, right? And more specifically, uh -huh. right, I feel like saying we should have fiscal policy and monetary policy work together, right? We want to run big deficits and we want to finance them through the Fed, right? The real question is whether, you know, the, re the, 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 the rest of the world, which is who finances whatever part of the deficit is not being monetized explicitly, right? You know, mm -hmm. whether they're, whether they believe this theory or not, right? Whether they believe, right. and the behavior of the central banks of Europe and Japan seems to suggest they don't, otherwise they'd be doing this, right? Um, and I right, don't, and it's not, and I don't think the Chinese, and I'm not much, sure the Chinese worse. believe it. Ah. You know? Well, okay, but see, so, I'm glad so, you brought the Chinese up. What's that? I said, I'm glad you brought the Chinese up. Right. Because this, to me, is what's, like, nutty about American politics, is that on the one hand, it's considered, like, a common sense populist thing to do, to complain that China is manipulating its currency. But on the other hand, it's also considered a common sense, you know, kind of populist thing to do, to complain that, well, we might be jeopardizing the, the dollar. Uh, but well, these the, are well, the, the first of those is thing. just silly. I think, I think the first of those is just a silly thing to complain about. Right. All right. If, well, if, if China's manipulating its currency, that should be hurting China more than us. Right. So it's a silly thing to complain about. That's my no, opinion. but I mean, I think that what it's doing is that, I, I mean, I think China is, in fact, hurting, you know, the median Chinese person. Right. They're helping Chinese exporters with a, with a strong U.S. dollar policy. Right. And that it would be I agree. in our interests to subvert that via, you know. Well, again, that would be policy. that would be a very straightforward thing to do if you didn't finance all your deficits, or if you didn't finance hundreds of billions of dollars worth of your deficits abroad, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, so the risk is not, the risk is that if foreign investors decide, well, geez, if the Fed is going to monetize everything, where does it right. end, right? Well, and they say, okay, well, sure. then I don't want to be, the, right, like these, right now, right, the market suggests, you know, everybody's very, very happy to lend you know, to the federal government. But those yes. sorts of situations can change relatively quickly. Um, and if they change, right, they will change, rel you know, you would expect them to change relatively quickly in response to a radical change in monetary policy, right? And particularly if that monetary policy is out of sync with the way the rest of the world seems to be talking about their own monetary policies, right? And, that, okay. and, and, I see, and the I United see States gets really big benefits from being the kind of, from being a country that is capable of financing its spending, uh, financing its deficits abroad in its own currency. That's a relatively rare thing, right? 
Um, uh-huh. And uh, it's actually an extremely rare thing to be able to do it to the uh-huh. ki- certainly uh-huh. at the kind of scale that we do. And if I were a Fed governor, right, I would worry more about, like, I would need to be really, really sure that I didn't have to worry about that scenario before I would contemplate, you know, going out on the limb of saying, you know what, our, you know, the, 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 the way we've thought about monetary policy for the last, uh, you know, 30 years uh, is no longer really appropriate for this environment. We need to think of it and think in a different way. Right. We, okay. don't, we don't want to. Right. We don't okay. want to try to keep this inflation is... low and slightly positive. We now want to think about you know raising inflation to catch up with the price where the price level. Right, 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 right. Okay. So I mean, this is definitely why. I mean, in the in the ideal case scenario, um, you need to have a, a long range, a long term deficit reduction uh, plan. And and I and I do think that one of the sort of underappreciated problems with you know, sometimes I think people look at these, like, long-range projections from the Peterson Institute, you know, and it's like one number is going up, one number is going down, there's, like, red everywhere. And, and some people say, well, you know, like, why are they complaining about this? Like, this is way in the future. Obviously, we can't let that happen. But, you know, we, we can cross that bridge when we come to it, but we need to be talking about now. Any, any trains that job. is unsustainable will, by definition, not be sustained. Right. And... I do think there's a lot to be said for for the other side of it, right? That if the long-term outlook seemed solid, that then policymakers would feel that they had much more scope to sort of, um, you know, go nuts. I mean, I I think, you know, one one way of looking at at the current dynamic is that, well, we have agenda crowding, and when people talk about deficits, that means we're not talking about jobs, Um, that's I mean, true. I, I do think that, not, talking about deficits is not talking about jobs. That's right. True. But I mean, I think talking that, about the Fed is also not it, talking about jobs. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that's right. At any rate, I mean, what, where I was trying to agree with you here is that you know, if we had a more solid long-term fiscal posture, then I think there's a lot more. There would be a lot more range for talking about job creation activities in the short run because our thinking would not be um, dominated by these kind of fears right. about. So about I what's really the because I, I mean really the fear here is in the medium term, right? I mean in the long term something will be done, and in the short term people are very willing to finance the debt. But what we're not certain about is when does that turn over? So that's another way of saying like like the the, the key ingredient there would be credibility, right? Why would anyone believe that you've got like even if you say we've just done something to improve the medium term outlook? Why would anyone believe that? Right. Yeah. Well, I don't. And, know. Well, the, uh, be, well. The, so then you have to look at sort of why does the medium term outlook look so bad, right? And that, as you well know, is overwhelmingly about um, healthcare costs, right? Yes. So that's the long term problem, and that's also really the medium term problem. You know, there's there's you know the, the the other the other things the other big numbers right that you could talk about right you can look at the right yeah, side yeah, yeah. and say you know we actually need some more revenue you can look at the you know defense expenditures and you can look at social security you know and you could sort of say uh-huh. can we save anything in either of those places but the big number overwhelmingly is healthcare, healthcare, expenditures, healthcare. right so what what could you possibly do not what could you do to reduce healthcare costs but what could you possibly do now that would make anyone believe that you have done something about healthcare costs and i think the answer to that right yeah. The only answer to that, right, is to somehow take the job of reducing health care costs on some level out of the uh-huh. political process. Because if it's still in uh-huh. – now, that's I'm not saying that you actually could do that either. But if you don't do that and it's still in the political process, then basically what you've done if you say we have reduced health care costs is you've said we have promised that we are going to reduce health care costs. And that promise I don't think is worth very much to anybody until you've seen that promise kept – repeatedly, why would anyone believe it? Well, that is a difficult question. And I think we're also probably out of time. No, we can talk as long as we like. I'll just cut it off. But um, um, No, but I mean, I, 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 I'm going to, you know, I, w- I would hang on if I had like a really great answer to that question. Um, well, so I the think- answer you don't like to that question, right, is going to be that voucherizing Medicare is, right, a component of that. Right. Like, no, or, okay. Well, no, no, no. I mean, they, he, so, well, here we go. I think you've, you've taken your, your tough question and now you've suddenly rendered it less tough. I mean, I think that it's, it's exactly the point that you raised. I mean, if we were to say, a la Paul Ryan, 
Well, everyone who's over the age of 55 now will get exactly Medicare. And then everyone who's over the age of like 50, you know, gets a voucher that's basically the same as Medicare. But in some hand wavy, you know, since 30 years from now, long after I'm retired, you know, future Congress is going to give you vouchers that aren't worth as much as healthcare costs. I mean, I think that just all of these problems uh, suffer from, from that same credibility question. Well, here's the difference, I would say. The difference is if a politician says we have to give vouchers that are worth more, otherwise they can't buy this set of benefits, that is a somewhat different conversation from we have to make this particular benefit no longer eligible, right? I mean, it's a it's it's a card it's 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 a three card Monty trick to a certain extent, right? You're hoping people don't see I the peak, guess. right? But that's uh, if you don't have that, right? Then what you're saying, like like your alternatives basically are either, right? You get people to buy off on the idea that yeah, what kind of healthcare I'm going to be allowed to have is decided by. Um, somebody I know the name of and I can complain to, or okay. I don't really understand how this decision was made and it annoys me, but I don't know who to call, right? Like, like to right. be really blunt about it, that's the reason to interpose a middleman, is that then people don't know who to complain to that they don't get such and such covered. That seems a little goofy to me. I mean, I, mean, I, think, I think the key to credibility is the refer- so because this, this is the problem, right? Yeah. People want to find politically viable solutions, obviously. Um, but people also want to find credible solutions. And I think that the problem is that those two things are in direct tension. That um, the way you gain credibility is by finding a measure that can be implemented now. Mm-hmm. You know, um, now it's true that the big impacts of the measure, you know, might be delayed. Right. But you need some that kind of... something in, in some fashion. Well, and, I mean, but, it can always I mean, be it's unlocked just, in the future, but, like... But well, it's, it's, it's that you have to have a fight with the right constituency, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you do something that makes current senior citizens say, I don't like this change, but you either get them to swallow it as part of a compromise, right. or you get it passed some other way, then that indicates that there is some kind of political constituency that can pass these measures. Whereas if your solution is like a sleight of hand, where it's like you just trick today's young people into not realizing that they're going to be old in the future, it, you've not really shown anything right. politically right. In, in terms of in terms of what it is um, that's doable. And that's what I thought was... Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think that th- I think that that's the way in which the, the consensus in D.C. has this wrong, that there's always an idea that you need to have some large carve out for for currently elderly people. Um, and I think that it's sort of the, the, the reverse. I mean, I the actual you're saying. You're scale saying, of the change saying, can be quite small, but you have to show you can do it. Right. You're 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 basically saying that the obstacle to reform is the organized elderly. And so we need to. You know, have a high, even if it's a it's small high-profile defeat of them, we have to have a, a, a some kind of uh, a defeat on the record, so people aren't scared of them anymore as much, right? Right. So you want the Democratic Party to take on the AARP and the teachers' unions, and and this is your path to victory. No, I don't really actually, um, but you know, it's a it's a. I'll put it this way: that would be my condition. Since elderly people are a very conservative, very Republican-leaning voting constituency, um, you know, if, if I was in Congress and we were talking about one of these, these you know, entitlement deals that's endlessly kicking around, uh, my condition would be that whatever it is we sign on for has to be implemented now. That it's actually that, that what I don't want to do is let Republicans get away with this sort of tax cuts now, spending right. cuts later kind of politics. Sounds sensible to me. Um, All right. The, 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 we probably don't have time. No, for see, any. you, you said it sounds sensible and, and so now, now I gotta, now I gotta go. <laughs> I'm going to declare victory. 
Feel free. I'm I'm all in favor of people not getting away with uh, you know free lunches in their in their arguments okay. for, either, for either side. So that's why I worry about the inflation is going to solve all of our problems, and I don't like tax cuts now and spending cuts later either. All right. Well, um, you know, with that, I, I I really should I really should wrap it up. Understood. We'll have to talk about food okay. another time. Great talking Definitely. to you. All right. Good to talk to you. Take care. Bye.